Hi guys, it's Bridget from the Brooklyn Education Center. And just remember, you can find us at becnyc.org. And I decided to make an extra video for you um, because they're changing one of the tests and I see people getting confused because I think, oh, but they're changing the test. And I'm like, well, they're not changing the math. The math is still the math. And the other thing I've noticed is um, people studying the wrong thing. You know, um, going and taking that practice test. Do not take that practice test, number one. But also a lot of the information that you are finding online, well, what is that created for? That is created for people, typically, that are currently in a math class. So it might be for someone who is trying to get a better score on the SAT, or they have to pass that final. But what's interesting, where I think you guys are so hard on yourselves, like every single person that is watching this video for their math test has already graduated from high school and passed math. They've definitely taken at least one math class in their undergrad. And you passed math. You aren't as bad at math as you think you are. But now you're trying to get back on the road and do it again. So I compare it to if I were to help someone go back down and take a driver's license test and they hadn't driven for a while. But I put them in the car. And by the way, thank you. Tom Bennett for the illustrations as we all love his illustrations. Would I put someone in a car if I had them go back down and try to retake that driver's license test they hadn't taken for years and put them with a GPS and send them on the highway? No. <laughs> Why not? It's too confusing. It would be anxiety inducing. It would be so much. And I would have to remind them, but you already know how to drive. Just like you already know how to pass math tests because you've done it for years. It's just been a while. So how would I help that person go down and learn to drive again? I would take them not on the highway, not with the GPS. I would take them on the local roads and I would ask them, do you remember, do you remember the rules like with the runway street? Oh, do you recognize that landmark? Make a left by the church. And so this is what we want to do when we're revisiting math. We want to go back and pay attention to what do I remember and what did I forget? And what are some of the rules I need to know? So what did I remember and what did I forget? If you think of these descriptions, no matter what math test you're taking, you're going to have arithmetic, algebra, geometry, and trigonometry. And I think the misconception in this is people like, <clears throat> not the trigonometry, because we have this idea in our mind that as we go down through these, they get harder. They kind of do, but not usually for the reason that people think. And the main reason is people don't know the definitions. I did this. For the last four classes where I'm like, do you remember anybody ever telling you what these words meant? And everyone said, no, but watch. What does arithmetic mean? Well, it means numbers and operations. What does algebra mean? All algebra means is that you use a letter instead of a number. Geometry is one that most people are really like, oh yeah, geometry, I like geometry. Geometry means shapes. Well, kind of, not really. Geometry means points, lines, and planes. 
and what we think of as a shape would be a square. A square is a two-dimensional shape on a plane. On a plane. What about trigonometry? Well, that's just the measurement of triangles. Just the measurement of triangles. And so the definition of the words and remembering what we forgot along the way is how we should study. Going on the highway and with your GPS system is just going to intimidate you. It's gonna to go too fast, it's gonna to be too much, and then you really are doubting yourself in your math when you actually do understand that. Arithmetic. Arithmetic means numbers and operations. Numbers. But the thing is, that's actually, in my opinion, the hardest thing to remember. Let's take a look. We have addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Those are the operations. But then we also have an exponent. And an exponent is something that some people forget. Mm -hmm. um, exponent would be three squared. I like to use three squared. And by the way, you will also notice that uh, mathematicians really like to keep it simple. I think people are scared of math teachers. Just remember, math teachers are not mathematicians. Mathematicians want to keep it simple. An exponent. 3 squared, 3 squared, 3 squared is 9, 3 squared is 9, and then do you see how it kind of flips in on each other, that 3 squared is 9, and then the square root of 9 is 3, kind of like flip back and forth. Now let's go to algebra. Algebra, oh no, algebra. All algebra means is that you use a letter instead of a number. Could we teach a first or second grade student algebra? We sure could, we sure could, we kind of do. Look at this equation. One plus blank equals one. One plus blank equals one. And this is the zero property of addition. And see how there's a fancy term for it. But zero property of addition just means if you add zero to a number, you get the same number. So I might give it to a student like this in class, which yeah, I think we should kind of turn this around. I think this intimidates us all. when we don't learn this from the very basic first, second grade. One plus blank equals one. But how could I make this algebra? Very simply. One plus x equals one. One plus x equals one. So now x equals zero. Can we teach that to a first grade student, a second grade student? We probably could. But do you see how we have this fear of algebra? Because we think it means so much more than it really does. All algebra basically means is that you use a letter instead of a number. Now we're going to geometry. Most people think it's point shapes, but it's point lines and planes points, lines, and planes. So if you use a plane, a circle is a shape. But let's go look at some of the vocabulary. What do we remember? What did we forget? So for example, a diameter, a radius. Most people know a diameter and a radius. And what is the definition of a diameter? A diameter is a line segment that goes from one side of the circle to the other side of the circle. 
So let's say this diameter is four. And what's the definition of a radius? A radius is half the diameter. So that radius would be two. Some people don't remember the word chord. In fact, most people do not remember the word chord. But here's what's interesting uh, about this. Um, a diameter is a chord. Because a chord is a line segment that goes from one side of the circle to the other side of the circle. But what's the difference between a chord and a diameter? A diameter must go through the center point of a circle. We can have diameters go straight down, they could go left to right, they could go on angles, but it must go through the center of the circle. And what this means is that it's the longest line segment in a circle. So mathematicians like to use a little rule to remember. A chord, see those chords? They're not going through the center of the circle. So they always must be less than the diameter. So if I know the diameter is four, and they ask me about a chord, what rule do I have to keep in place in my head? Just to keep it straight. A chord is always less than the diameter. And this is so useful on a multiple choice test because if they said, oh, and thank you again, Tom Bennett. Think of a chord like in music, somebody's playing the banjo, okay? Can you see how this might be confusing to a student? Because even for you right now, if you're just looking at it, it they all look almost like they are the same length. But one of them is going through the center. So if the diameter was four and all the other lines were not going through the center, what is the rule that we need to know? It must be less than the diameter. So if the diameter is four, the, and they, they gave me a multiple choice question and they said, what is the chord? The three, four, five, or six. Well, if the diameter is four, it's gotta be less than four. What is the only possible answer? These are rules, landmarks, driving, man, things we forgot that we just wanna go over again to remember. Trigonometry. Trigonometry is just the measurement of triangles. The measurement of triangles. And what we see here is the Pythagorean theorem. And by the way, I have another video that goes into it more, but I just want you to see what I mean about the definitions. There's actually a term. And again, chatting my math teachers, they don't tell people this. <laughs> They're called Pythagorean triples. And what is a Pythagorean triple? Well, what's the Pythagorean theorem? The Pythagorean theorem is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And what are we doing right now? We're doing algebra, why? <laughs> because if you have a letter instead of a number, that's algebra. What else are we doing right now? Uh, we're doing arithmetic with our exponents and our square roots. What else are we doing right now? Well, we're doing geometry because we're using a shape and lines. 
So see how it all kind of folds in to each other. The Pythagorean triples are something mathematicians will use because it's, they like people to understand things. You know, I think people think mathematicians want to confuse people. No, that, that, that might have been your math teacher, but that's not a mathematician. A mathematician will use Pythagorean triples, three, four, five, or six, eight, ten. And the reason they would use them is because it keeps it simple. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And what we're trying to figure out are the sides and the hypotenuse. Again, I have another video. But watch how simple this is. Three squared plus four squared equals, three squared is nine. Most of you can do this. Three squared is nine. Four squared is 16. Nine plus 16 is 25. What is the square root of 25? Five. Three, four, five. And I want you to notice that's, that's a lot of this, all this other stuff in here, but that's a whole number. It's a rational number. It's easy to work with. If I were to use this as a question where I ask the student to take it one more step and do something else with these numbers, this would be simple for the student to do. Six, eight, 10. Six squared is 36. Eight squared, by the way, that, that's one that throws people, do your multiplication calculation. Six squared is 36. Eight squared is 64. 36 plus 64 is 100. What is the square root of 100? 10. So see how it comes out to 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 10. Now why would a mathematician use this? Because these are whole numbers. Rational numbers. Watch what happens when we don't use a Pythagorean triple. Again, we're still trying to find out the side. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And we just decided to use five and seven. Five squared is 25. Seven squared is 49. 25 plus 49 is 74. But what's the square root of 74? That's the number. <laughs> I have an official term for this. I call it a hot mess. <laughs> it's a hot mess. The square root of 74 is 8.602 going on and on. Can you see how why, how and why a mathematician would not want to use this in an equation, especially in a word problem, where we might have to go on and do another step? This is an irrational number, an irrational number. And I want you to start to notice something. What's actually the hardest part here? It's actually the numbers, the terminologies of the numbers. That's what we forgot. Because we're like, wait, what's an irrational number? What's a whole number? <laughs> I just call it a hot mess. <laughs> now look, it's really interesting. What is a rational number, a whole number, integers, it's, it's, 
you look them up and they have all these different definitions. I always say it's, it's, it's something like when you look it up and you look up the definition, you need a dictionary to figure out the definition that you just looked up. But let's see if we can make it simpler. The way mathematicians try to keep it simple. Nine and seven are both whole numbers and they're rational. Do you see that hot mess? Are they going on and on and on? The, the most famous irrational number is pi, 3.14 and it goes on and on and on. But see how these, no, they're rational numbers, they're whole numbers. Where it becomes a problem to remember this as a student or as a teacher is when we make it the square root. Nine and seven are both rational numbers. But what if I asked you, what is the square root of nine? What is the square root of nine? Most people would know the square root of nine is three. Is that rational or irrational? That, that's rational. Remember, it's rational. What about the square root of seven? And see, this is where I want you to have a little more faith in your math skills because the fact that you know the square root of nine is three, there you go. And the fact that you don't know the square root of seven, there you go. The square root of nine is three. And that's a rational number. But the square root of seven is irrational. It's a hot mess. <laughs> Do you see it just goes on and on and on and on. And that is not a number that mathematicians would really like to use in equations if they're testing the students on basic math literacy, because that's very confusing and nobody would remember that. But here's something else, ha ha, ta ta. <laughs> Mathematicians also like to kind of keep things organized. So the square root of nine is three, and that's rational. What do we notice about the number seven? Seven. Hmm. What kind of number is seven? Seven is a prime number. What is a prime number? A prime number is a number that can only be divided by one and itself. So let's see how that, that's Remember, nine and prime. So there's a rule that we can use. This is not possible for us to remember all the numbers, all the rational or irrationals, but especially when it's a square root because it's contained in to that square root. The rule is the square root of prime numbers are always irrational. So if you look at, what is the square root of two? See how it's a hot mess? That, that, that's how I explain it. It's a hot mess. <laughs> Nobody would ever remember that. The square root of three, see, it's another hot mess. These are irrational numbers. So all I would tell my students to remember if they were taking a test, the square root of nine is three, and that's rational. Nine is not prime, and then the square root of prime numbers are always irrational. That's a rule. Now, here's the other interesting thing about the number nine. Why, why is it not prime? What does a prime number mean? A prime number means 
a number that can only be divided by one and itself. So how do you divide two? Mm -hmm. Two and one. How could you divide three? Three and one. But how could you divide nine? Nine and one, but also three. So what is that number called? What is the opposite? And I want you to look that up. What is the opposite of a prime number? The opposite of a prime number is called a composite number. A composite number. And see how before we were using single digit numbers. So I really wanted a student to be able to keep this straight in their head. My two numbers that I would use would be the number 31 and the number 36 because 31 is a prime number. You can only divide it by the number one and 31. But look at 36. 36 is a composite number. This, the minute I saw 36 anywhere on a test, I was like, the most important thing I need to know about that number is that it's composite. Composite means it has all these different factors. We can divide 36 by 1 and 36, 2 and 18, 3 and 12, 4 and 9, 6 times 6. So instead of doing all of that work, I want to know the definition, the terminology. And I want you to think about something. Of all the things that we've gone over in this video, and I want you to rewatch the video, because I'm not putting a handout on this video. I want you to sit down and take the notes on it. What's actually the thing that was the hardest? Was it the algebra? No. Was it trigonometry? Not really. Actually, it is the definitions of the words. And this is why I don't want you to get on the super highway and, you know, go take practice. There's a lot of people that I really like, like Khan Academy. I love Khan Academy. But he's creating work for people that are currently in a math class. So before you do any of that, I want you to learn your definitions. And that's what I see people, I don't, I, I, I honestly don't know why people want to do calculations. I also think this is why people don't like math because they didn't realize, you know, when we were in school, we were kind of pushed to do the calculations instead of the vocabulary. Whenever I ask teachers, well, if you don't like math, what would you like to teach instead? Most of them will say, English, reading, creative writing. And I'm like, well, why do you like that? Vocabulary. So this is how I want you to study. I don't want you to take practice tests. And I don't want you to get on that highway until you've watched every single video as I go through the things we may have forgotten. And it will still be math. You can change the task forever, but math is always going to be arithmetic, algebra, geometry, trigonometry, sometimes a little calculus, but whew, lucky us, not on this test. All right, so I hope this makes sense, and I'll see you guys soon. Bye.